The sun has continued to shine in the tropical paradise that is South East England, which pleases Alan. So I'm leaving him to enjoy another gloriously setting orb as I head inside to do yet more serious work. One unwritten yet undeniable rule of life deems that a turbocharger removed must be replaced, and so we shall comply. This is the void left on Alan's book engine in the aftermath of the turbo unit removal you'll have studied with interest a couple of episodes back. An interim job I needed to do was, using a copper brush, cleaning out the engine's exhaust outlet. There was some soot inside I loosened and then henried up, and then the old gasket needed to come off. It's the sort that, with extreme heat from the exhaust gases, bonds to the steel and forms an excellent seal. They're very much single-use gaskets. The residue left behind is aggressively bonded, which I'm sure you'll agree was a good thing. It's lasted over a decade. Lots and lots of brushing later, I have a clean steel face ready to take a replacement gasket in due course. But we must turn our attention to the sticky out bits. These steel studs are original, and I'd like to keep using them if possible. I first saw how well they took a nut. A couple were smooth and therefore happy, but the others were a bit snaggy, and one actually wouldn't accept a nut very far at all. So, back to the copper brush and some oxidation remover spray, which has come in handy recently. That top left stud still wasn't playing the game. My fear was that it wouldn't survive this particular battle. My last ditch attempt was to try and reshape the end of the stud, and that of course requires me to take on the role of the artiste. The shape and symmetry of the stud's end needs to match that of the nuts, and so with a combination of file, brush and more deoxidization spray, Finally, the stud accepted a nut without much resistance. That stage, done. Now for the oil supply and drain piping. The drain first. Importantly, as well as stopping anything entering the piping through the days the engine sat turboless, I want to avoid detritus falling into the drain and so into the oil system. A nitrile glove to seal, and back out with a copper brush. I wasn't entirely sure what the black residue was, maybe Paris gasket, but it stubbornly endured, and although I got a fairly clean surface in the end, I also used the plug from the turbo cleaning company to temporarily protect the drain. I'll also tidy up the paint job once it's back together again. So you'll have just seen that of course I have prepared where the turbo is about to go back on, in particular where the exhaust gases come out of the engine and will end up in the turbo itself. Um, but the most important thing, the grand unveiling, Here is the turbo back from the refurb guys and it's all been blasted clean. Uh, they've rebuilt the whole thing. Uh, nothing's actually been replaced because everything passed the tests but they just wanted to make sure that everything was pretty much as good as new. Uh, there we go, it's all wrapped up. It's been pre-oiled but um, I'll have to take off all of this uh, plastic wrapping and we can get it back on the engine. Here's the pressure clean turbo. I wish I could have brought you more about this process but I had a problem with the workshop owner down in Hampshire it seemed agreed as I signed on to give him the job for me to be present during the diagnostic test, any disassembly and repair work and so on, and to film some video clips. A sort of behind the scenes for a skill and knowledge stable that I don't possess. Alas, my emails were ignored, and finally I was simply told that it was ready for collection and had been for some days. The turbo apparently passed the diagnostics, so no seals or bearings were changed. But I saw no test results. I wasn't given the chance to approve or reject the proposed disassembly and cleaning work, and they refused to give me any sense of costs until I received the payment demand on completion of the work as a fait accompli. It looks clean and smart, but the process ended up being far from what I had hoped for. For that reason, part of me worries about how healthy my turbo actually is. My trust with the mechanic was lost. But enough about my feelings, you're not here for those. I lined up the turbo on the mount to orientate myself and plan what order the reassembly would take. Of course, there's more to do first. Let's do the gasket. I bought proper book ones, and they are the same for both the engine to turbo flange and also for the turbo to exhaust pipe flange. They are larger than the old originals. That, ladies and gentlemen, is value for money in action. The gasket fitted onto the clean steel face and studs, and then I'm protecting the studs. I'm not sure what they chose during the initial factory assembly but I don't want the studs to corrode. I've been warned against using stainless steel studs, as well as more exotic metals. This is temperature stable copper grease applied to the basal halves first. Then we can slot on the turbo. 
The unit's significant weight is taken entirely by the engine mount and these four studs. The oil apparatus is far more fragile and not structural. Unsurprisingly, this all goes together nicely and I just wanted to be careful not to trap or twang that delicate looking oil supply pipe. If I fractured or stressed it in some way, the repair would be fiddly and most likely ruinously expensive should I need to get an original manufacturer's part. Some of their pricing is hilarious, that unique flavour of hilarity only possible when it's not you footing the bill. I've popped on a couple of normal washers for now just to keep it in place whilst I do the other tasks. The large turbo hose goes back on. It was healthy and expensive and so received a stay of execution. The water cooling circuit, a major subject of an upcoming video by the way, contributes pretty much all the hoses snaking their way around the engine, in and out and in and out of both the engine and the boat. It does get in the way and this is one of the three circumstances I've found where it gets in the way too much. One loop of cooling hose is in contact with the engine's dirty air vent and has been slowly rubbing thin with the vibrations. This shall not do. Anyhow, cooling later. Let's get the old braided breather line off. It would have probably survived nearly forever as it doesn't channel fluids, but if I'm swapping out new hoses, I might as well do them all. Since the diameter of the hoses is quite narrow, I'm not reusing the old Jubilee clips, as apparently the smaller ones don't tighten into a perfect circle. Instead, stepless single ear O clips. The bottom one was very pleasing, but the nipple at the turbo end turned out to be very slightly larger. These inconsistencies in gauge are rife on this engine turbo cooling circuit system. I only managed to get it on half as far as I wanted, but far enough on to get an O-ring to close. It only transports air, so I'll see how I feel before deciding to replace it again or leaving it. The hose still touches the other hose. I've used Kevlar tape elsewhere to protect hoses from chafing and you'll see that in the cooling hose video. Imagine the anticipation for that. This is where we get yet more serious with my set of various gaskets, washers, nuts and so on. You will of course recall the copper greasing of the base halves of studs before the turbo went on. I bet you've been able to think of nothing else since. And now it's time to make sure the other halves are protected too. Once satisfied we're suitably coppered up, we'll come to my choice of nuts. I had a choice of materials and designs. Carbon steel nuts are likely to corrode, even with precautions. Brass is an option too, but I've gone for stainless steel, largely because that's what my chosen design comes in. We're going with Aerotite. It means I can go without washers like the ubiquitous but much hated spring washers, and also without the need for Nordlocks. These Aerotites are expensive, but we only need four for this flange and four for the exhaust flange. On they go, and without forgetting the little brackets that need to fit onto the uppermost pair that will support the turbo top cover. I categorically didn't forget to fit those, have to remove the nuts and then do the whole thing all over again. I whined and complained enough in the previous episode about how awkward the angles were, particularly for the lower left nut, so this time I'll show you effortless triumph as we complete the mounting of this part of Alan's turbo. On a high, attention can turn to the oil drain fitting. This involves a couple of little bolts I've cleaned up. They came with spring washers, so I'm using Nordlocks instead here, zinc coated instead of stainless. I had to do this pretty much by feel, and the first one went on fine, but the second was awkward and I was scared about cross-threading it if I tried to force tighten in a peak of misguided optimism. But finally that too was on. The first time I tried, somehow the little green gasket shifted off centre so I had to loosen and try again. Before tackling the final step, I was advised to do a little top up of oil so that there would be minimal chance of a dry zone within the turbo on the first engine restart and before the engine oil pressure had risen and oil begins circulating properly. So, What I don't have is a correctly sized funnel in order to get oil down into the turbo there. What I do have is a load of spare sealant gun nozzles so I will adjust this, chop the end off and that will work. God, I did sound confident. Little did I know. My mini funnel seemed fine and I decanted some oil into a cup, ready to carefully pour into the turbo. I poured, slowly I thought, but then panic. Oil left in the funnel, which meant I'd overfilled. I don't know whether manually turning the turbo would have drawn more oil through, but it only needed a few milliliters. I'd overestimated how much by about four times. So I resigned myself to an overflow and a clean-up job of oil dripping down the sides of the turbo. <laughs> Anyway, I cheered myself up with the banjo bolt, the design and operation of which it turned out I completely misunderstood. 
I thought the two perpendicular holes in the shaft needed to be orientated. I didn't realise that these fittings allow flow regardless of orientation. So marking the hole directions on the top was unnecessary and I could get the final quarter of a turn complete when tightening it up. I'll repaint the top and the oil supply pipe to hide the evidence of my overthinking the problem. Now, behold, you're about to see a teaser of an upcoming episode, the upper section of Alan's brand new stainless steel exhaust. The reason is to check everything works properly and to get oil circulating. So I'm popping the gasket on and using some temporary studs and nuts. My hope is that I'll run it for a short enough time to not generate the heat required to activate the sealing action of the new gasket, as it will need to come straight back off, and it would be a shame to waste a gasket. We have success, or at least absence of disaster. Before I go, you can have a tantalising glimpse of some new installations, some of which are made possible by two particularly discerning channel members. Do please join them if you can. First, a rather excellent AIS transponder. Yes, it's not plumbed in yet. And this equally excellent radio. They are positioned for ease of wiring later on, and so the radio can be used by whoever is driving Alan, and also by more lowly people. I've moved the compass mount so that they are less likely to have an argument of the magnetic variety. I promise it hasn't taken me two whole months to unbolt and rebolt a turbo. To come in future weeks, some of this, making this rather bizarre thing, and I've been going around causing drips. Congratulations, you have just, for the most part, voluntarily watched a man bolt one piece of steel to another larger piece of steel. Bye.